Hello and great day, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, this, this is, is Shane and Tanya from Wash Your Brain. We bring you this special radio television broadcast in order to give you the very latest information on an amazing phenomenon. And we are very happy to welcome back Freeman and Jamie for part two of our talk on Hollywood Mind Control. Welcome back, guys. It's so nice to have you both, Jamie and Freeman. Thank you so much for coming back and doing part two. How are you? Doing well. I'm good. In part one, we dove into your minds as we discussed your extensive knowledge of mind control and Hollywood and the entertainment world, illuminating the princess and warrior programming and everything from cartoons to the music industry to the glorification of vampires and monsters in books and movies, where children today are literally raised in broken family units by TV and video games, and how this is no accident. But before we pick up where we left off, I'd like to give you two an opportunity to discuss some of the feedback raised by part one. I'll start with you, Jamie. I know you got a bit of flack for illustrating how women should reclaim their domestic status in order to fix the broken family unit. You made a, a, a statement that said that, you know, us women should get back to the kitchen. Uh -huh. And I, th I thoroughly agree. But I think that some people may have taken that out of context. Would you like to discuss that? Sure. Uh, well, when I said, you know, all women should get back to the kitchen, um, I wasn't trying to be misogynist. I was really just offering up yeah. my, my best advice because to me, you know, the kitchen is that, that sacred space in your home that attracts people to you and everyone's always hanging out around the food. You can't do anything without yeah. food. You know, you can't throw a party. You can't expect people to, to stay at your house and, and, and visit with you if you don't feed them and give them something to drink, right? We learned that. So I would say... If you're offended by what I said, it's because you have these certain triggers, you know, that people just attach to and get all worked up over. And that's not really what I was talking about because, you know, how do I put this? Uh, if you're offended by that, then you're thinking like a slave because the kitchen is for women, especially it's, it's your alchemical laboratory, right? It's the answer yeah. to all your problems, whether you think you're fat or ugly or depressed. It, this is all nutrition. If you want to really talk about secret esoteric knowledge, then there's nothing that's more well hidden than nutrition mm -hmm. right now. Very much so. You are what you eat. Mm -hmm. That's why they want us to eat cows because so we'll act like cattle, right? Yeah, <laughs> this exactly. Is, this is a, um, a secret of the Illuminati too. They know that when you eat raw live foods that it extends your life. And this is a, a secret that they've been pursuing throughout history is the secret to longevity or you know it used to be blood drinking and, and consuming live animals and stuff like that but now we figured out that eating live plants is just as good and, and actually better for your spirit yes and what you can do too when you cook I mean I know you know that when you cook something and you put your love into that then it, it gets ingested by the person that you serve it to mm -hmm. it's um it's wonderful what we can do with food and how we prepare it Absolutely. You know, we were sitting back laughing about the, the, the fact that we don't know where we diverge from the common reality. So in the, the comment section, which I try to avoid the comment section, because you got <laughs> yes. to understand the people who comment and that, you know, mm -hmm. 30,000 people may watch it, but 16 of them will, will feel the need to give you some sort of negative feedback. But yet they never tell us what their opinion is or where we diverge from their reality. So we're left in this position of having no idea of where, you know, we, we just get the comment that says, you're insane. This is uh, <laughs> off the, the charts or, you know, and, and we don't know why. <laughs> like, yeah. well, maybe if somebody would explain why they think that we're off the charts because we feel that we have very documented scientific proof for everything we say historically backed up and we feel like scientists coming at something very logically and then we get the emotional response of people that have their triggers hit like the get back in the kitchen trigger or just the ones that say that you're just nuts and never explain why so, mm -hmm. it's easier to name call kind of than it is that. to actually voice an opinion sometimes it's true well, the other rally cry was to call us homophobic Jesus freaks. Yes, isn't that something? Let's discuss that. Well, I felt that. the need to address that as well. Because we're not out to say homosexuality is bad, that it's, you know, the, the, the cancer of society or anything of that nature. 
our whole purpose of bringing the ideas of homosexuality into this cultural agenda is to say that it is purposefully placed out there to direct children and mm -hmm. therefore is not anything to do with the culture of, of gay liberation or gay lesbian liberation which again is right there with the same liberation movements where people feel yes. that they're being given something but actually everything's being taken away and they're being separated and isolated mm -hmm. point being that we were seeing an agenda a, a forced a uh, social norm put through Hollywood that you know really leads back to the Nazi party and and how the Nazi party was formed. Well, if you want to talk about this, there's a really good book called The Pink Swastika and it outlines how the Nazi parties are very well they're first anti-feminist in every way. Mm -hmm. Um so they wouldn't even consider, you know, sex with a woman it it wouldn't as be as how do you say that? I don't know. Because um, I'm thinking about the fact that the Nazi party formed inside of a, a gay bar and that the the whole concepts that they would, would attach to homosexuality were your village people mentality where the only the butch homosexuality was acceptable. If you were an, an infeminate gay or a flamboyant gay, then you were ostracized and even and thrown into the camps. But if no. you were dressing up in your, you know, your village people uh, <laughs> S and M wear and <laughs> ready to go. To and whip, then you were you were a good Nazi. It's like with anything else, it's not that they created it; it's just that they kind of uh, seized the opportunity to almost pervert it or um, steer it in a direction that best suited their agenda. Use it as a tool for sure. And I uh, saw Britney. Okay, so you know how Lady Gaga is famous for, um, you know, her her gaze, right? She's yes. very big in the gay community. Then there was this uh, this interview with Britney Spears right before the VMAs, and she she does her little shout out, and then she says, um, "And thanks to all my gay boys, right?" Mm -hmm. And this was quite shocking to me because I'd never heard Britney say anything like that before. I was I was kind of like, "Whoa, Britney! You know what did they? Uh, this is part of the agenda, obviously." Yeah, she's never actually. Yeah, she's never. You know, not especially not like Gaga does. And whoa, these VMAs, wow. Did you guys see those? I, I just watched some bits and pieces and couldn't believe it. Yeah, the, the thing that sticks in my mind about the, the most recent VMAs was Katy Perry's performance. Her E.T. song where she sings, I want to be a victim, I want to be abducted. Yes. Or your different DNA and uh, I, I want you to mix with our genes together. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of goes back to what we were talking about with the um, the vampires and the fallen angels taking the human women. So this is a a mantra that they're singing. I, I can't even imagine all the little girls singing along in the radio saying, "I want to be a duck." Team two, uh, uh, Beyonce was singing, "If I Were a Boy," and Lady Gaga comes out as a man. Yeah, Gaga. Ga, ga. So we have all this gender um, confusion going on. And why do you think they're doing that? Well, the hermaphrodite. I'm, Freeman can tell you a lot about. The, the magical abilities of the hermaphrodite, which has been oh. worshipped throughout history, but this is one of the archetypes that they're calling on because um, that's the the philosopher's stone, right? The the merging of the male and female to create this this unisex essence, which God is unisex, angels are unisex, and all this. So they're trying to put these together in one person. So here's the question: Is is this just popular culture, or is it manufactured? And for us, it's so obviously manufactured yes. that we, we hardly even feel the need to explain how or why because we've followed so many leads to bring us to this mentality. And that's when I say we don't know when we diverge from the common reality because we would think that it would be so obvious to the entire public that what we see in pop culture mainstream media is crafted, it's placed there, uh, you know, basically, Brittany fell from her her spotlight, you know, had her total meltdown, shaved her head, saying she doesn't want people plugging things into her anymore. She didn't want to be used anymore. And this is the exact same thing that Arizona Wilder, who claims to be one of the mothers mm -hmm. of darkness, said mm -hmm. she did as well. She dyed her hair brown so that she couldn't be used in the rituals. Mm -hmm. And when that didn't help, she shaved her brown hair off. And when we see with Brittany, you see that she goes in to shave her hair off, and it's brown. She, it's the same story. She didn't want to be used anymore. But yeah. then, as a trauma-based mind control victim, 
you have nowhere to turn. This is why I believe Hollywood hangs all together. They're the only ones that could possibly understand one another. The troubles that they've gone through. You know, we've got Corey Feldman coming out saying the pedophilia dealing yeah. with Hollywood. Right. And so none of this is uh, someone reaching to the tops. I mean, when we look at the list of icons that have made it, Britney Spears, Mouseketeer, mm-hmm. you know, Mouseketeer, 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 Justin Timberlake, Britney, Michael Jackson, you name it, Madonna, Prince, they're all connected to Walt Disney. There mm-hmm. is no reaching the top. There is a filter of the occult, of secret societies that allow and also write the very music and lyrics that are going to be projected into the next generation. And this is the part that we don't understand why others don't understand. <laughs> yeah, well, they just don't see it. Another example of that blonde hair, brown hair uh, dichotomy was in that movie Tangled that we talked about last time. The mother cut her hair off, it turned brown, right? It was, it was no longer magically charged. Yeah. They also uh, did quite the ritual there with Beyonce this year with um, her unveiling her pregnancy. Um, mm-hmm. Popping the belly and uh, of course you have Kanye West jumping all over Jay-Z as if he didn't know when he's so excited for him. Mm-hmm. That's quite obviously all been planned and you know, all just a, kind of an act to produce yet another one. <laughs> what do we think that Beyonce sat behind the scenes going, you know, I'd really like to have a dance troupe of riot squads. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, they, 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 they come up with this on their own. This is sociological programming. Exactly. And to jump, and of course we can go back to other things, but on that note, um, I really want to talk about the transhumanism agenda. For those who do not know what transhumanism is, uh, a brief definition Transhumanism seeks to use radical advances in technology to augment the human body, mind, and ultimately the entire human experience. It's a philosophy that supports the idea that mankind should proactively enhance itself and steer the course of its own evolution. Transhumanists wish to become something called post-human. A post-human is someone who has been modified with performance-enhancing body and brain augmentation to the point where they can be no longer called human and have mutated themselves into an altogether new being. They use nanotechnology, which is the science of creating machines, which are the size of molecules. And I was just reading last week that they are currently developing neurochip interfaces, which are computer chips that connect directly to the brain in the hopes of increasing the human intelligence into a supercomputer. And all this programming is all the rage in the latest video games. And terms like augmentation are now like the new buzzwords. And this is a perfect example of this programming telling us that we are being controlled by technology and that the human augmentation is enslaving us all. So if you weren't good enough now, you're not going to be good enough for the future unless you get augmented. Mm -hmm. This falls under a category I like to call sorcerers and robots. And in the olden days, a mind control slave used to be called a golem, which was a little doll that a sorcerer would make out of wax and inscribe the, uh, a sacred name on its forehead and, and animate the doll, and it would be a perfect slave for the sorcerer that had created him. It was named mm. a golem, just like in Lord of the Rings, right? Yeah. But now they've had, um, they've perfected their mind control techniques, you know, from Nazi Germany up until today with the trauma-based mind control, but also with the food. So this is an attack on our biology, and that's what I see transhumanism is. And and food is a really good segue into that because there is nothing out there hardly anymore that is readily available that will support your life. And we were talking – I don't know if we talked about energy drinks last time, but I found a good quote on the back of an energy drink. And it says, for centuries, cults and governments have used juice to do and conform the masses – now, after extensive research and development, Lost Enterprises has harnessed the hypnotic power of juice. The truth hurts. <laughs> so, basically, the, the energy drinks and all, all this crap food that we're eating is attacking our blood, right? Because yeah. um, our blood is made of sugar and everything that you eat nowadays has high fructose corn syrup in it or some other kind of processed sugar that is just the most horrible thing that you could be eating. Because they don't want people to be naturally in tuned with their biology and with nature anymore they want them to want to feel better with the the robotic body so then we look at people that are starting to promote this concept 
of a transhumanist agenda. And you find characters such as Rael, who is supposedly mm. the ambassador of our extraterrestrial gods, wanting to put an embassy in Israel for the Elohim's return with the Star of David and Swastika as the icon on the ceiling. But yet here Rael comes out before Congress and, and talks of human cloning, and he talks of the uh, computerized drugs, computerized sex, and the way that this would be so much safer. And he leaves you with the idea that, well, you know, your parents will never understand this, but they'll just die and be replaced by you. So this gives the kids this out of thinking their parents are, you know, behind and, and, and not worth their time. They, they can't keep up. We have mm -hmm. other characters that come up, such as Jacques Fresco, as we discussed a bit with the Zeitgeist and the Venus Project. And except yeah. a giving over all of society to a supercomputer to control all resources and to keep humans in line because obviously our emotions are the problem. <laughs> emotions are the thing that the transhumanists really attack the most. Mm -hmm. mm. And then you get to Ray Kurzweil and his, you know, transhumanism is really his baby. He's the one that's laid it out there and promoted this concept. He neglects to see the nefarious angle of transhumanism, even though he discusses robotics in the military. He seems to think that once we achieve this type of uh, technological advancement, that humanity will go into a golden age, never recognizing the, the divergence that would come from those that didn't chip themselves to those that did, and also the, the height of the military that has no way... I mean, once you're dealing with a, a transhumanist military against a, a human force, you know, there's no winning. There's no way out. So he has a very optimistic outlook on transhumanism, as did Rael or does Rael. And yet they really aren't seeing the issues here as we watch robotics start to take over. Uh, this 9-11, we just had the 10th anniversary. All of the headlines were reading 9-11 allows for more robotic spying, more robotic uh, terrorist watch. And they're starting to, to load all of the drones up into, into the atmosphere around us, you know, flying through the skies. And they have deck applied, if we want to use a strange word, uh, <laughs> their, their amount of robots that they're using to surveil the United States and, and everyone else. So there's many levels to this. And if we're not Really, you know, if you're not paying attention, you're not following the script, you're going to get left behind and also be in a whole lot of danger if none of us are aware of, of where this is all going, which is a separate culture, a breakaway culture that will think that they are superior to the, the non-mods, you know. i just like to mention that Disney does own Electronic Arts Gaming along with Marvel uh. Comics. And uh, these are, I mean... Uh, I know we, we, we talk about Disney, but they're, they're are, are at the heart of this whole thing. And when you start to see that, I, I hope that you'll stop thinking of us as kooks and nuts and start to realize that there is an agenda and that it, it does have goofy ears, you know? It's, it's not all simple and, and fun like everyone thinks. And there's, there is a program. So Disney owns these electronic arts games. They own Marvel. And... What's coming out in these games, in these videos, is an agenda and, and mm -hmm. is purposeful. There's a video game called Two Human. It's based on Norse mythology, and all of the uh, Norse gods in this particular video game are just human beings who have been cybernetically enhanced. And um, the first thing that they did was take the place as gods among humans because obviously they were more you know, advanced because of the technological enhancements they were stronger faster all that jazz and therefore they could assume the place as gods above the rest of the people which kind of speaks to what you were saying about uh, the breakaway civilization or breakaway culture that is kind of uh, inherent to this whole uprising it's because once people start getting augmentations it's going to be x-men all over again you know you're going to have the mutants mm -hmm. versus the humans or the the augmented versus the humans and it's just segregation once again yeah if we well, look good at point the International Space Station right now, uh, at this very moment, they have six adult stem cells sitting up there for generating longevity. They want to test <laughs> it. And then they've got Robonaut 2 up there. And now they're discussing having to evac evacuate the Inter International Space Station. 
due to the failed rocket launch in Russia, which is is bizarre to me. Okay, this story doesn't doesn't compute for me because they're preparing to launch the SpaceX Dragon up to the International Space Station November 30th with a uh, a craft, their Dragon craft that attaches to the space station. So there should not be this this fear of evacuation when we have a privatized space program ready to jump into the the fray. And yet they're telling us they're going to have to evacuate. And if they did, then this leaves a robot and some stem cells or, you know, potential clones up in the International Space Station to control things from up there. This (laughs) takes me straight to Battlestar Galactica and to Star Wars storyline in Star Wars. You've got this endless war because you've got droids Mm -hmm. fighting clones and it's interesting emotional place to be when you're set in this war front on the film. As, as a viewer, and you're looking at, at droids and clones battling, you have no emotional connection to either one. Neither one is real. Neither one is human. So they can kill all of them that they want without anybody feeling bad about this. And also that just perpetuates this endless war because, I mean, how how long would that go on if you could just perpetually make more robots and clones and, and just let them keep warring until the end of the world? Well, I'm just really confused because... I, I don't know who sees this, what you call augmentation, as a good idea because I've been watching the world under this, these control mechanisms for 30 years. And this is just the newest one. And so I don't, I don't even know who would be wanting to, to do this kind of thing, I guess. But. Well, and that's why they, they introduce it to the children. You know, here are these kids that they've already been conditioned and programmed to not love themselves and to feel. Uh, inferior and to you know be forced to compete you need to look perfect and be skinny and be this and be that and now hey you can get augmented and be better than you ever were from the position of a gamer they make it seem amazing I mean you've got all these enhanced abilities you can jump from building to building you know you can you can crush large objects with your bare hands I mean you're you're pretty much like I said a god you know all these what we would call maybe ascended abilities, but enhanced abilities, all because of, you know, computer technology. It's very appeasing, you know, there's no there's no work involved in that. The person themselves, the individual, the child, doesn't have to, you know, try and better themselves at all. They've they've got technology to do it for them. Have you guys and, seen that movie Metropolis? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Did we talk about that last time? No, I don't think we got to that. Let's talk about that. Okay. Well there's this great movie called Metropolis and there have been a lot of homage paid to it by stars of today like Madonna and Queen Mm -hmm. and uh, you know it was in the movie The Bodyguard and in this movie is um, set in a a dystopia where the wealthy elite live above ground in luxury and then below the ground the the workers live far below and they keep the the cogs moving in in the machine city metropolis Mm -hmm. right and in that movie there's a, a black magician who creates a robot to basically incite a war between the workers and the elite. And he he makes her out of a combination of of technology and black magic. Interesting uh, mix. (laughs) Magic and technology. The robot that comes out is kind of a hermaphroditic robot. Here we have Beyonce and Kylie Minogue wearing this costume that the, the robot displays in the movie Metropolis. Beyonce's mm-hmm. worn it for her her concerts, and then she also has this robotic hand that she displays sometimes, which is also from the movie Metropolis. I, I really recommend it to to watch if you want to see what what society is really like. And consider this dystopia was written in 1927 in Germany, prior to the the whole Nazi revolution, and the concepts that were brought forth. Uh, lead into UNESCO, which has a ride in Disney World. It's a small world, which is one of their main themes for population control, uh, and takes this whole story to uh, to the worship of Molech, and and steps that are now becoming part of our mainstream truther culture and understanding the elite. But when you see Metropolis and you witness the the pentagram ritual as they bring this uh, horror of, of Metropolis to life. And then she, you know, she becomes this evil, vengeful being as opposed to the love machine that I think the magician was trying to have. Um, 
this going all the way back to 1927 and the concepts of augmentation are, are have been with us for a long time. They have a uh, channel now, and on Disney Junior, many, many of their shows have to do with like the interaction between robots and humans, or um, even instead of using humans that are genetically augmented, they use various animals that you know, can now talk because they have these computer chips or can now do this because they have this, you know, technological augmentation. So obviously it's still a very strong push from Disney to our kids, even to this day. It's continuing. They haven't stopped. I've also noticed that just about every kid's movie, like a movie intended for a child audience, has been either robots or aliens. Um, Very interesting push there as well. Yeah, I'd wondered often why they would remake Fern Gully as Avatar. It just made me think of old Batty and his idea, you know, that he came from a lab and he had been augmented and had, uh, you know, technology sticking out of his head. Exactly. And really, this still correlates with Avatar as well. And if you don't know this, Avatar is simply a remake of, of Fern Gully. Uh, same story, same everything, except now we have the military involved with all of their uh, exciting new toys that the kids get to learn about. But on top of this, they have the whole concept of mind transfer technology into a clone, the idea that you need certain genetic traits to be transferred into a particular clone. And right there, augmentation again, because you're willing to to put your brain into a computer. And anyone that doesn't think that they're working on this, I highly recommend looking into what's known as the Blue Brain Project, which is making a, a computer capable of transmitting exabytes of information and this way be able to actually house somebody's entire mind inside of a computer and curiously enough the blue, the blue brain project has yet to have that type of uh, uh, ability they have not yet generated a computer that can push exabytes but cern has and the cern lhc grid or the large hadron collider grid which is 200,000 interlinked computers through direct fiber optic lines, is capable of pushing this type of information and is is, uh, capable of mind transfer technologies. So we're looking at a world where the elite are finding all the means and methods of extending their lives, of finding these augmentations, of being able to transfer their minds into other bodies or even into robots, as Michael Jackson had attempted to do then you realize why the UNESCO and Disney would promote it's a small world. Because once you're starting to live a thousand years, it will be a small world. So yeah. this this would play heavily <laughs> into why they would have an, a eugenics campaign. Well, let's just talk about Satanism and technology for a second, because those two go hand in hand. Um, you know, Arthur C. Clarke, he said that any advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And if you think that, uh, you know, Satanists are, are just role-playing in robes and altars, then, then you haven't met wrong. one. Yeah, because <laughs> they're technologically advanced and scientific. You know, tell them about Rex Church's device. Yeah, I really didn't expect this at all. And we've all seen the film by Alan Moore, Hellboy, and the concept of the Nazis using technology to punch a hole into the other dimension to, to make contact with demons. Mm-hmm. Well, lo and behold, when I met my first Satanist, which was uh, Rex Diabolus Church, and he's a rather famous Satanist, having been raised by Anton LaVey himself into the Church of Satan, and now has turned his back on the Church of Satan for saying it's not satanic enough, and started <laughs> his own church now, which is called the um, uh, the Chaos Imperium, I think is what it was. So he's starting his whole new thing. But his whole thing was to build... A device that opens a portal for the old ones to enter and wreak vengeance on planet Earth. The satanic church, these old ones, correlate to H.P. Lovecraft's fish Mm. people or the god Mm. Cthulhu, made famous from the South Park episodes, right? Uh, So he is actually trying to open these portals for Cthulhu to come through. And when you watch Alan Moore's Hellboy, you'll see that that was very much a Cthulhu-type character coming through there as well before Hellboy escapes. 
But yeah. so we find that actually these Satanists are techno mages, techno magicians that are trying to find ways to incorporate electronics into their magical practices. And, and this one is actually building a, a huge device and hopes to turn it on in 2012 to take out the Illuminati, actually, he has in mind. Yeah, it's interesting you brought up that South Park episode because in it, um, they used the Gulf oil spill as the reason that Cthulhu came back into the world. I was reading uh, in the Satanic Rituals by Anton LaVey, oh, this is written in 1976, the ritual to you know Cthulhu were the old ones, he said a perfect place to do it would be an offshore oil rig. So wow, straight from the Satanists themselves, you know. <laughs> and you consider what they actually did with uh, sinking all that oil to the bottom of the ocean, telling us that, you know, the bacteria would eat it or digest it yeah. or whatever. Well, you it, it's have not, to, it's still sitting there. You kind of have to view these these catastrophes kind of as... as um, the rituals. Revelations. Also, you know, what kind yeah. of seeds might they be opening? You know, in, in the book of Revelations, during the last days, they open the seal and the earthquakes, and they open the seal. And, you know, what could they have opened with the oil and brought up onto the earth that wasn't supposed to be there? Or from breaking the Pentagon, which was actually a kind of a ploy in, in a certain movie. I can't, or maybe it was a comic book. I don't remember where that came from. But when we look to the Pentagon and you realize what a Pentagon is the inside of a pentagram, and a pentagram mm -hmm. is it's a shape that a magician would use to bind and control a spirit. If they were then to crash this missile, plane, whatever you think might have hit the Pentagon, into the side of the Pentagon, then opening that seal and releasing whatever demon might have been confined under there. Uh, that might have even been in the Watchmen. I'm not sure. I can't remember where that uh, was actually used in a, in a popular culture. But it's one of those concepts that definitely struck me when, when the Pentagon was hit, whether they were releasing or the seal that bound that the demon that our elite have confined using their magic. And this is the thing, too, is to try and express to people that the elite are magic practitioners. And this has been a hard one to try to get through yeah. to the public, even though we have all these examples. We have Ronald Reagan and their astrologer, We've got Hillary Clinton and her big booty goddess that she placed out there. We've got Barack Obama's uh, uh, mother-in-law practicing, practicing Santeria in the White House. I mean, you know, how many examples do you need? We could probably go on. We saw the, the altar, the Masonic altar that Roosevelt broke with his leg brace. Uh, you know, we could go on and on about the elite and their occult practices. So the idea of the Pentagon being shaped as a Pentagon, as a magic ritual, is not outside of our norm. And when you realize that, really, the Nazi party, the SS, the, uh, came to America, Project Paperclip and many others, and that their belief systems were incorporated into the CIA, the NSA, and that this idea never died it's not like the nazis were a political party they were a group of occultists that were trying to change the world in their view makes me think also of uh, some conspiracy theories that are going around um, regarding stargates uh, one that comes to mind is the gulf of yemen and some kind of commotion that's been going on there a lot of people theorize that that is the opening of a stargate meant to bring something you know from off planet onto the planet and when you were talking about opening seals and that kind of thing, it immediately triggered in my mind that that's a lot of what that had sounded like to me at, at the time was just like a what we would call a seal opening, whether that is actually mm -hmm. a Stargate or not, or just a straight up a seal. Um, there's well, definitely something that's going on there, and I don't think that it was an accident. I think if the it other was an accident, core. we wouldn't have all the military there. Exactly. The other correlation to this is that we, we recognize that the pentagram is a symbol of Sirius to the Freemasonic mm -hmm. order, to uh, you know many of the occult orders, all the way back to Egypt and Isis being Sirius. And we find all these correlations, connections to Sirius. When that Yemen event happened, and anyone can go look this up, there was absolutely an unexplained magnetic anomaly in the Gulf of Yemen uh, right off the coast of Aden, which is supposedly the, the, the Garden of Eden and where Cain is buried. At the same moment while this was going on, the Ethiopian cardinal was announcing that he had the Ark of the Covenant, which is also believed to be some sort of uh, portal opening device. 
right at that moment, what caught my attention with the Gulf of Yemen and this whole situation was that they announced the piracy of the Sirius Star. And that was the ship that was being supposedly attacked there in the Gulf. And this was the alert. And and anyone that's in an esoteric order or Freemasonry or any of these studying ancient Egypt would immediately be clued in and cued by the word Sirius Star. Because that's mm-hmm. what caught my attention. So it was the piracy of the Sirius Star, the secret star of the, the elite, that brought every nation to the Gulf of Yemen. And yeah, it's too curious that we'd have China, Japan, Russia, America, you know, every nation right there with their battle cruisers. Uh, there was something more obviously going on. And, and for my attention, it was caught by that Sirius star symbol. Yeah, it's definitely what I was thinking too uh, when you brought up the seals, because a lot of people claim that it would be a stargate. But um, if you start to take in mind the Syrian star and the idea of how seals work and the pentagram being a seal, then it all kind of, you know, makes you kind of look in a different direction than than just possibly a stargate. One thing we can uh, go into, Jamie, in part one, you had mentioned that you have your own system of magic called slack magic. And we would love to hear about that. Okay. Well, slack magic is something that I thought up because I don't know if I'm alone in this, but I think things on planet Earth should be pretty easy and Mm -hmm. we shouldn't have to be working so hard and going nowhere and having nothing when we're at the end Um, and it's kind of a a counter spell to Crowley's system of magic where he uses the the will force right anything that you want anything that you will you can make it happen Mm -hmm. this is kind of going against um, conventional magic where the magician he he recognizes that he's the microcosm and the macrocosm and he's part of an a bigger body, right? And so when an organism has cells that go against the organism and start doing what they want, that's called a tumor. And if they get really good at it, then it becomes a cancer. So slack magic is kind of the anti uh, philema where you're kind of surrendering your will to a higher spiritual authority and recognizing that things that you may want aren't always good for the whole. So it, it has a couple, you know, I, I'm working on it. It's going to be something. And, and I hope people will call themselves slack magicians because, you know, let's talk about slack for a second. Um, yeah. I kind of borrowed that uh, concept from Church of the Subgenius. And Praise Bob. <laughs> in it, they talk about a lot of conspiracies and stuff, but uh, um, they say that the ultimate conspiracy is the powers that be robbing you of your slack which is your free time. And so the slack is the, the moment of creativity, that, that moment where you are not bound to, to do something and, and you can just create for yourself. And this is why the aristocracy were the practitioners of magic, because they were the only ones with enough leisure time to be able to practice this type of you know, magic. <laughs> yeah, right? Everybody else is working. So if we were to bring the slack back and and if people could recognize that each of their days was worthy, it's the worth of the human that's being attacked and the concept that you're not worthy of existing on planet Earth unless you are slaving away under some corporate banner. You start to realize and take each day as a Saturday and you get up in the morning and you've got your time to do whatever it is you feel like doing. And then what we found is that humanity... Our creators. I mean, whether you want to take it that we are created in our creator's image, we are creators. That's what Mm -hmm. separates us from the animal world is that we make things. And if you think that you can take that creativity out of people by removing them from their corporate slug jobs, you know, the wage slavery and whatnot, you're insane because people will continue to create. They can't help but create. And this is the big split between what people think motivates people and what does actually motivate people because money is not a motivator it's it's a it's a whip uh yeah but it's not the motivator that makes people want to be ingenious and create so slack magic promotes that you have enough worth of self-worth inside of you to create something of value for all of humanity even if it's just sitting in your house creating something out of crayons and paper, your your time is valuable. 
So Slack Magic absolutely just turns it on its head, but the the catch to Slack Magic is actually having faith. Now there are a lot of the religious people that that spout and spout about having faith, and I've asked each one of these, well, have you ever tried to exist without money? Because <laughs> this is the ultimate faith when you yes. turn your back on currency. It's it's a leap of faith that only a few have tried. And yet it has sparked this new movement of synchro mysticism and the concept that the universe is actually working in your favor, that when you go out without any intention of your own, the universe provides intentions that actually speak to your true soul's purpose. And you actually feel like you're fulfilling your true purpose in life instead of some corporate monsters purpose. And having faith in the fact that synchronicities will come into your existence and guide you is the part that people need to learn first. And then we could start to modify a society on these beliefs and on the very faith of synchronicity. Tenant of the slack magic system is, you know, let go of your ego. Because ego death is um, a very, very deep esoteric concept. Uh, the, the yogis use it. Um, it. It was symbolic, you know, when, when Jesus was baptized and, and he came back and, you know, no ego. So that's also recognizing that you're part of a whole and not just alone. Wasn't there a, I'm thinking of a, a lady from Germany just recently who... 69-year-old woman that decided to turn her back on money. Thank you. Decided that what she could do was, well, what she attempted to do was to create a a, a free store for okay. the homeless and the the destitute to have what they need. But what she found was the people coming to her were those that had just recently been let go, left, lost their jobs, and, and the homeless really had their own shtick already and didn't seem to need her. But the new people that had just falling from their foundation then did. And in this, she she gave up on the whole storefront idea and just started offering her services to people. And so now she has no money. She doesn't want it. She's written two books on this, and she gives all the <laughs> money away. It's beautiful. Uh, <laughs> because she found that she was so much happier and that she, she all of her needs were met simply by servicing other people just being their friend uh, helping them with the dishes whatever that friend happened to need or the person that she ran into and this is the life I have led as well I made friendship my currency and I made it my true purpose and I wandered this earth for a decade without a job without anything really and never ever did I ever want for anything and this is the part that people really need to to let sink in is that there are loving beautiful generous kind people all over this globe that the media is lying to you with csi and all the concepts of these evil humans and you have to go and put your faith back in humanity to wrench it away from these sorcerers that are leading you astray with the ideas of gold and economy and how did you do it like Practically, you had faith in yourself, you had faith in your higher power, you had faith in, you just had faith, right? You yeah, believed well, it. If there was any commandments in Slack Magic, it would be, thou shalt not worry. Yeah, very good. Because <laughs> worry is worthless, and you know, it really takes a toll on our body, because how many it times does. have we worried about something, and then gone through it, and looked back, and said, well, that was stupid, what was I worried about? Mm-hmm, but and worry <laughs> creates... Yeah, Whatever worried. it is that you're worried about. <laughs> but it's never as bad as our imagination can make it, right? And so mm-hmm. why put your body through that, that taxing process when there's no need for it? Yeah, the lack of worry creates as well. And so then when you free yourself from any of those confinements, uh, all of a sudden you find that you're not in any trouble with anything. or It, uh, it works the opposite way as well. Another part of the feedback I was laughing at is that people were calling us paranoid. When actually, I practice pronoia, right? I <laughs> nice. think everything is going right for me, even though yeah. it might not seem like it in the moment. You know, the perfect example of this is missing the plane that crashed. And so in the moment, you feel like it's the worst thing that ever happened to you. You're going to have to go through all this, you know, ticket and get another flight and all this stuff. But then you find out that it was actually divine intervention on your behalf that saved you from a catastrophe. You just had to wait and figure out 
you know, why is this happening to me and what is the greater good that's going to come out of it? And too often we step in our own way and everyone wants things to go as they have analytically created it to go. And so we get caught in these cycles and everybody goes out and they know exactly what's going to occur that evening. They've thought it all through and they go and, and that is exactly what happens. They go, they meet their friends, they drink their beer, they speak of the things that they knew they were going to speak of and they come home. This is the mental limitation that keeps you confined. When I left, I had no mental limitations. I don't know why I was, I, I guess I was raised in a nurturing environment. And this allowed me to not think of any sort of peril, which is one of the reasons I can identify the ideas that are placed in Hollywood and in all the TVs to make you feel as if you're constantly in peril. You won't even branch out and, and attempt this. But I wasn't raised with that type of mentality. I was pre-programming. Uh, and it seems a lot of the programming doesn't stick with me anyway. I never could understand money from day one. I found that I could... Well, I just started making juggling sticks and I found I could sell them and, and make them anywhere in, uh, that I wanted to. And so I never gave it a thought. I just jumped in my vehicle and left and went to go find another park to make my juggling sticks. And once I made those sticks, I you know, found another park and it just kept going. And I eventually I'd return home and and start to tell all of my tales to explain all of the places I'd been, all the things that I've seen, the people I've met. And they were amazing tales with famous people and great places that people usually pay millions of, you know, spend their, save their whole lives to go visit. I'm doing it in a weekend, every weekend, going <laughs> here, there, and everywhere. And I return home and the people were like, well, how did you do that? How did you afford any of this? And it wasn't until I was actually questioned that I even gave that any consideration. No, I, I didn't even know I was doing something, you know. I just, once it was questioned of me, though, then I, I started to wonder, well, how did I do that? And what, <laughs> what was it? And so I started to outline and database this whole concept of synchronicity. And at that point, the Celestine Prophecies came out, James Redfield, and... When that was outlined, I said, there it is. This is exactly what I'm doing right here. So if you ever need a method, I, I am a minister of the Celestine Prophecies. Ah, me I too. <laughs> me too. It changed my insights. life. Yes, absolutely. Practice That's phenomenal. Insights. And it all comes down to being foolish enough and child enough, childlike enough. I never child -like, let my like, yes. child die. That's a good example of, of slack magic because when you're doing it right, people will conceive you as a fool. Yeah. But that's okay, because, you know, the fool is the first path of the magician. And if there was a good example I could think of, of, of someone who's practicing slack magic without knowing it, it would be Forrest Gump. <laughs> yeah, yeah he, he, just, he would be our messiah. Yeah, for sure. he just wanted <laughs> life doing, you know, what that's made him That's a great happy. example, yeah. And he came out the winner, you know, he was a, a Fortune 500 uh, CEO, and what did, uh, they, what did met he the say? president several times. What know, did he say when, when they brought up that he was a millionaire? Uh, oh, they uh, said... Just one less thing. Yeah, you don't have to worry about money anymore. And he goes, well, good. That's one less thing. You know. There was no <laughs> ego involved, you know? It was just, okay, well, yeah, so I don't have to worry about it. When so often these multimillionaires are given some sort of credibility just for the fact that they've made all this money, we're giving them false... Uh, Glorification. Glorification, yeah. When the whole idea of being able to release yourself from the ego, even having multi million dollars and not thinking yourself any different than anyone else around you. This is another spell within the money spell is that, that elitism where people think that they have some sort of value sociologically because they have money. And mm -hmm. this is usually quite the opposite. But so you and release worry. yourself from that. You look to the Celestine prophecies and you find that we all have control dramas. We've all learned how to be psychic vampires at child's age. And so you start to confront your own control dramas, be that you turn aloof and hide yourself and demand people to give you their, their attention or you become erratic or a... Uh, uh, an interrogator where you're constantly barraging other people to suck their energy. And the mm -hmm. whole reason that we have become these psychic vampires, and each and every one of us has the psychic vampirism trait, 
is because this true beauty of life has been removed from our system. And as we drive down our streets, we see nothing but corporate monstrosities that look like plastic Lego buildings with you know, yeah. both primary colors staring us in the face. We've lost all sense of beauty and worth. And so then without this beauty to build our souls with flowers, life, love, dancing, uh, we then supplant that by sucking energy out of other people. And this is where the true ego comes into play because that's where your psychic vampirism starts to come out. Synchronicity put me in front of this microphone. I did not choose to come here. And the only mm -hmm. reason I stay on the air is because lovely people tell me how wonderful it is to hear me. I have no ego involvement in this thing whatsoever. I did not have a soapbox that I was hoping to stand upon and shout to the heavens. I simply had a tale to tell and a wonderful, miraculous events in my life that I think should be shared. And it turned out the rest of the world wanted to hear this as well. And so the only reason I keep going is because people keep telling me how much they love me. And that's the difference in, in how you can, you, we get put into a particular category of soapboxers. You, people yeah. think that you're talking because you want to attack an enemy, you want to make yourself appear superior or in knowledge or whatever. With, with Jamie and I, and I'm sure you guys as well, we just kind of got placed in this. It was our soul that said, hey, we got to try and share this with the people, but we're not standing on any soapboxes and trying to create any witch hunts. Yeah, absolutely. It's we about a time to come together and support each other. I mean, shoulder to shoulder, eye to eye, no more pyramids, level and equal. Well said. Let's talk about what, what do you guys got planned? What do you, how are you going to spend 2012? I couldn't see any better way of spending 2012 than to be in a big old hippie school bus <laughs> and traveling the United States and parts beyond Guatemala, Mexico, go find the Mayans. It seems that the rest of the world was right on target with us in that they donated us a bus to, to go. Uh, obviously, the rest of the world wants us to do this. Ah, tell us about it. Well, we're pretty excited about it. It's a big old yellow bluebird, and it's it's we're, we're getting it all set up. We got the Wi-Fi set up for it already so that we can do live or recorded broadcasts. And we're starting what we call the Friendship Agenda. And so nice. we have friendshipagenda.com, which is where all the wonderful people I've met in my travels have gathered together under a social network to start sharing with each other and sharing our own resources, our homes and everything else. Because as I said, you know, we found that we need pioneers and homesteaders. So there yes. are those that are staying in the towns and building their gardens and having open couches for the pioneers. And then mm -hmm. there's the pioneers who are going around sharing their love and sharing their energy with all of this and bringing energy back into the home fronts. Because a lot of times you get stagnant when you're not on your road magic trip. And unfortunately, yeah. the world doesn't know about road magic. Any traveler <laughs> knows and they will all discuss it and, you know, yes. hope the prophecies have discussed it. Uh, anyone that's, that's just free, home free actually knows of the road magic and how beautiful people are and how beautiful people come into your your world to share with you and then they want your energy as well so you fulfill the whole insights of lifting these people's energy because that's what we got to do to get out of this situation there's no political front that you could challenge that would do what just meeting your neighbor would do and once exactly. this starts to grow, we're, we plan on taking this school bus out and alerting people to themselves <laughs> and nice. promoting global block parties and to start to get the people together. And then who knows, we could end up with a massive caravan leading <laughs> down to the Mayans for their winter solstice ritual on 2012. I can't think of any better place to spend uh, that day than that place. I mean, come on. Yeah, this whole trip just kind of grew out of an accident when we first went to England to go to the AV2 conference. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't know how we were going to spend a whole month there or how we were going to do it, but we just kept getting invited to 
lovely home after lovely home, and we could have kept going. You know, if we didn't have to go home, we would have had <laughs> homes to go to. Now, let's just be clear that we we bought tickets for an entire month. You know, to not fly back until a month later, and we had a hundred and eighty dollars in our bank account. We had more homes than we could possibly have ever made it to. Yeah, and the same went for Australia. You know, if we went to all the places that we were invited to in Australia, we could have just uh, stayed there forever. But um, so we just decided to to live this way. You know, hop on the bus and go meet everybody that had invited us in the U.S. or where we could drive to. Um, just because they were all so cool. You know, that's why we created the friendship agenda because we would get there and then they would. Be Tell the best us everything people in the they world. knew and, and have no one to talk to about this stuff. I'm so glad you guys are here. But we're like, well, we have 20 other people in your town that are on the same tip that you need to get together with because we're not going to be here forever. So we made this website so everybody could get in touch with each other locally. You see, money breeds this concept of elitism that you can demand things of people. Focused on a friendship agenda or friendship as a currency, then no longer do you have commanding powers, but have to somewhat submit yourself to the the needs of the friend you're with. That's incredible. And, and you'll find out things that you never could have even thought of. So that's the critical ingredient is we're limiting ourselves to only what we can conceive and the magicians or sorcerers in charge are limiting what we can conceive, even limiting words in the, the dictionary, which was written by Freemasons, to limit the concepts that you can hold in your mind. This very limitation has to be broken, and you have to be the fool. You have to feel foolish. And that's like anathema of this current social structure is you can't not know. Fools right now, what the kids do is just blurt out any answer because I don't know is not an answer and makes you a fool. That's how they cover up chemtrails because everybody says, oh, well, it's just this. They will <laughs> form their own answer to it and then believe it. And this brings me back to uh, food again and corporations and rainbow. Out at the rainbow gatherings, now every day we've got to decide, and, and Einstein said the only thing that kills brain cells is making decisions. This is why he only had one suit. He didn't <laughs> want to have to choose. And yeah. Every day we're forced into constant decisions. Where will I eat today? How am I going to feed myself? What do I need? When you go to rainbow, you find that your food needs are all met. And I have literally witnessed people begin to shake and shiver and just quake to the floor as the trauma leaves their bodies and they don't know what's going on. But the truth of the matter is, is they've never felt secure before. And when you have all of your food needs met without any questions or doubts or making of decisions, then you just suddenly relax. <laughs> and none yeah, of us yeah. relax ever mm -hmm. until you're put into a position. So let's say that Rainbow met reality, the real world, and you walked out your door and there was your neighbor cooking up some great pizza or lasagna and you didn't have to decide on what you were eating. You were fed this love vibe and your whole day was just then the creativity is there because ah. all you have is your time for creativity. That makes all you me cry a little bit. That would be fantastic. Wouldn't it? I was thinking it's weird because um, we went to this conference in Philadelphia and one of the first speakers was Jay Parker, an ex-Illuminati um, satanic ritual abuse victim. So here he is talking about satanic ritual abuse, and he goes through his, his spiel, and then he starts talking about solutions, and he brings up this one book called Natural Cures. They don't want you to know about they yeah. in quotes, you know? Have you mm -hmm. heard of this book? Yeah, yeah. I read this in my early 20s, and I always thought it was kind of weird because he, talk, he, he glosses a little bit over the elite and how they try and control the food and all this stuff. But I just thought that was so interesting um, because if you want to talk about satanic ritual abuse, just look at the food you're eating, right? And you're self-abusing yourself every day when you make bad decisions about what you're putting in there. And, you know, the, the one of the first rules of magic is know thyself. You know, you can see mm -hmm. this on the portico over the temples at Delphi, know mm -hmm. thyself. <clears throat> and so how do you know what you are if you don't even know what you're putting into yourself, like you said, you are what you eat. That's yeah. why they try to make us eat crap and and they want us to eat cows so that we can act like cattle. The food control is a transitional thing because what they want 
is to have you chip, you know, the whole transhumanist movement because yes. they, they want you to have a brain chip. And this reminds me of <clears throat> this cattle farmer describing his cattle. He had all his cattle linked up with chips, right? And so he mm -hmm. goes to the wall and he flips a button and, and half of the cows go moo and they stand up and they walk over to where they're supposed to be milked at. And he flips another button and, and they go moo and they, they, you know, they just do whatever he wants. And so this is the, the goal of the elite. It's not body enhancement. It's just more social control. control. Yeah, flip a switch. It is a, a dark, dark topic. And honestly, I've never been more frightened than when I studied trauma-based mind control. And with, But once you start to see it, then you see it's in everything. And to the point where you watch a Britney video and she's speaking on, what, butterflies and what was the robots? Do you remember the end of the Britney video? And then you, you oh. go to Fritz Bringmeier's How to Create yeah. a Totally Undetectable Mind Control yeah. Slave. In the newest video, she's wearing a Mickey Mouse t-shirt. Um, and then at the end, she's giving a press conference. And this guy comes up and hands her some seashells. And he's, like random, right? Yeah. <laughs> I like dreams and seashells. And then he just, she switches. As and, if she'd been triggered. Right. And he leads her off the stage like, it's time for you to shut up now, right? And mm -hmm. the seashell. So I, I went and looked in Spr Fritz Springmeier's book. I looked it up and it said that um, they use this for scaring the victims because they tell them that plants and seashells can hear everything you do and they're going to relay it back to the programmer. So you're always being watched, basically. Uh, uh, written long before this video was ever made, defining seashells used in the exact method that they use it in the Britney video to scare her to shut up because she's up on a on a newsstand podium. And when you start to know, you know, you can watch Heroes. You go watch uh, The Butterfly Effect. This is one now, if people want to truly understand what Hollywood stars seem to go through and what many of these trauma-based rituals, satanically, ritually abused children go through, you watch the butterfly effect. Now, I want to say that some of this concept going into magic has to deal with creating a moon child, which mm -hmm. is something that the uh, people like uh, Jack Parsons of Jet Propulsion's laboratory oh, Ron was Hubbard. into, uh, yeah. Ron Hubbard, trying to create mm -hmm. this moon child. Uh, you get into my studies on Anna Nicole's baby and my belief that she was a moon child ritual. Well, Alistair Crowley's book, known as Moon Child, is subtitled The Butterfly Net. And it is a trauma of in, in then trying to invoke a god form into the child, which is also the Cain Chronicles of Walt Disney's uh, The Red Pyramid. Same story trying yes. to put a god form into a child. And this was trying to make the, the child a willing recipient so that she'll get augmentation from these spiritual powers. So when you go and watch Ashton Kusher, who is a known Kabbalist, uh, performed a, a Kabbalist wedding with his wife, Demi Moore, you know, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. realize where Hollywood is. You know, realize that also Ashton Kusher is working out at the gym, getting ready for the end of the world the belief patterns that these people are in because they're the ones programming you and you watch the butterfly effect and step by step if you were to read uh, how to create your undetectable mind control slave by Fritz Springmeier step by step it is the movie the butterfly effect so go and you know and and put yourself through the atrocity of actually watching this film and then understand that this is the mentality that is creating pop culture the uh, the moon child rituals is something that uh, when I brought up uh, Beyonce's pregnancy unveiling earlier was the first thing I thought of as well just the uh, the general excitement of oh, everyone involved and, and um, you know <laughs> well, gee I, I wonder interesting theories about Beyonce because she just has the most interesting career like uh, I, I see her as the new high priestess of Hollywood Yeah. so it's like move over Madonna there's a new high priestess and her name is Queen Bee and she comes from a group called Destiny's Child. Dad was her manager, you know, that old yeah. chestnut, right? But then she also has some, some weird phenomena with the Obamas, right? She's singing, at last my, my love has come along at Obama's inauguration. Oh, that's right. What's up with that? Well, I don't know. You know, if they can bring back Akhenaten, why not his wife Nefertiti? 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's what, that's where I was going. The pop world. That's where so I was going even the... with the baby and the, uh, the kind of who's rise that? of Beyonce. Mm-hmm. I mean, like from the outsider perspective where people are just looking at it as media, they say, oh, it's because of Jay-Z, but who is Jay-Z as well? We understand that he is very involved as well with the Illuminati. So you put the two together and then you put together all the different rituals that Beyonce has been a part of. Mm-hmm. coming right up to this unveiling of the baby and, you know, at the end of the show, popping open her, her belly to show everyone that she's showing and everyone just going insane. I mean, Lady Gaga was crying. People mm-hmm. were people were very happy about that. It was so, as if the pharaoh had had a new child. Exactly. Yeah. That, exactly. It was the birth of, I want to say Christ, but I didn't well, want to give it that. When you think of all the resonators they put on her, that that's a word that Steve Wilner likes to use when, when they use... Um, a celebrity in a role, like let's say Keanu Reeves is Jesus, and then he's always resonating that that Jesus, right? Have you heard of that? Oh, yep. Yeah. Okay. So they p- pretty much made her everything. You know, she's been Isis, she's been the evil robot from Metropolis, she's been the whore of Babylon. All these resonators they're putting on her. I can't think of a single uh, deity, female deity, that they haven't dressed her up as, right? I and, agree. Yeah, uh, that's, that's right. Yeah. And the Black Madonna has an even deeper esoteric meaning to the Jesuits. You know, I'm reading some books on that right now. I haven't really got to the end of, of the whole Black Madonna story, but, you know, it seems to me like it would be Isis. Magdalena. Yeah. <clears throat> but so I just who is some... that baby's daddy? <laughs> well, yeah. um, Jay-Z said that he, he was a reincarnated Egyptian priest. That's a, right. One time, I think. So we start to see who the elite are and what they actually think about. And that's the critical thing. It doesn't matter if any of it's true. They believe it. And most people just don't see. I, 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 that's where I have a disconnect with the rest of society is where I don't, I don't see where I disconnect from the rest of society. Yeah. I don't mm-hmm. understand. I wish people would tell us. Instead of just saying you're a fraud or a shill, tell me why. Your reality because... I have some hard found science that I, I'm following and, and so far it all follows suit. I mean with the Obama situation and the idea of me calling him a clone of Akhenaten and then he's battling Apophis, Akhenaten's Satan. <laughs> yeah. uh, then they come out and say they have Akhenaten's DNA along with Queen T, Nefertiti and the two daughters. Then they announce that they're not going to allow human cloning on any country. He says he's from Krypton and sent here to save Earth. <laughs> And and then you follow this all up with the uh, head scars, where and the, and it mm. seems that Akhenaten's cone has been removed. To me, you know, the statement is out there, the hypothesis, but then the evidence just keeps piling in, and it it doesn't it doesn't detract, it doesn't dissuade. It's all right there. It actually fits. <laughs> so where is the disconnect? Is I'm it- with you on that for sure. Um, like just people all notice that there's a you know, a global elite or people that are a tier above the rest of us and they don't really question how they got that power. Everyone thinks that it's just money, but where did that money come from? How did they uh, incorporate it, incorporate it all together to begin with? And I think that it all comes back to, you know, their understanding of magic and their understanding of the older esoteric teachings that, um, Meanwhile, they've been beating it out of us, like, you know, by showing us movies and video games and all that and saying, you know, that's fiction. You're not able to do any of that stuff. We're going to do it all behind closed doors, though, and uh, just not tell you about it. Yeah. It's funny to me that when you try and talk about Princess Warrior programming, people don't really understand what you're saying, but this is as old as Barbie and G.I. Joe. Yeah. Yeah. They, They were the original military and princess and so it, it's been 50 or 100 years of, of this programming but i don't understand why you people can't see it or should they tell me <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well maybe they will maybe they will now maybe people will speak up a little bit more i think most of the people that do speak out though like like we've said it's an emotional response to you know feeling threatened that their beliefs aren't what they believe them to be good old crumbling paradigms yes. mm-hmm well, Jamie, you have done some studies um, in regards to Bible code, and we'd mm-hmm. love to hear about some of that. Well, ever since antiquity, people have been obsessed with you know the Hebrew version of, of the Bible and, and searching out codes. Even Isaac Newton was convinced that there was a code that he couldn't crack in it. So there's some great books written called The Bible Code and The Bible Code 2, and basically what they did was take all the letters of the five books of Moses and they put them in one long string, and they found that um, with equidistant 
letter sequencing is what they call it, they could pull codes out where they cross-reference each other and like dates and times like, you know, Hitler would be crossed with Nazi or uh, Twin Towers would be crossed with 9-11 and all this stuff. So it was interesting to me that they couldn't crack this code without a computer. And even oh, the Bible wow. code itself said that the Bible was written by a computer. And this made me think of, um, we were talking about the hermaphrodite, right? The male and female. So this, you could also um, symbolize this as the target, you know, the point within the circle called the circumpunct. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, a rep if three-dimensionally, that's the phallus and the, the chalice, right? Or a one and a zero. Yes. Yeah. But the uh, the sign of the target and the eye of hell um, correlation right. there. Yeah, because South Park played on that once again. Uh, we're always amazed by Trey and Matt's knowledge of this esoteric conspiracy. But even in South Park, he has the, the computer as Yahweh. And when you start to realize that there was a high technological past, when you look to things like the anti-Kythera mechanism... Uh, mm -hmm. This was a device made with, I believe it was 33 gears with uh, gearing that, well, there was no possible way it could have been crafted in the, the age that it was found in the strata of the earth, showing it to be thousands of years old. We have this mechanism full on with gears and differentials. And uh, so we have to start to understand our ancient past a bit more. And that's where the elite have us is that they have some knowledge of what occurred in our history and we don't and they yeah. are keeping the majority of our history from us and so we can never figure out where we came from or where we're going but yet we have all these memes that stream up such as Battlestar Galactica and the ideas of clones and drones uh, that keep returning to us and we can see the progression of society through this transhumanism that we are seeing clones and drones coming to the forefront and the troubles that this will cause. We see that in movies like Moon, where you start to see how clones could be abused, or even The Sixth Day with Arnold Schwarzenegger, which uses uh, Lucifer as their movie icon and makes films on Nazi worship and child labor camps. Uh, and, of course, Arnold Schwarzenegger was, was a heavy promoter of human cloning and also a Nazi. Uh, his father even being an SS. So once again, the elite stand out alone in their belief systems and have understanding of our ancient past that will allow them to progress and know where progress is going. And then they'll simply predict and promote into us what parts of it they want us to know. And so when you start to realize things like the Bible only being able to be transcribed by a mega computer, then you can start to piece kind of this eso occult theological study together because the, the Bible absolutely is a deep study that shouldn't just be tossed out the window because you don't believe in Jesus. There's yeah. a lot of knowledge that is hidden inside there. Thinking of the machine, what are the monoliths? Yeah, the monolith is interesting because it was the first prototype of an idol. You know how the Bible describes you should not have idols. Well, the first one was actually a monolith. And so you go to Arthur C. Clarke and then the movie 2001, Stanley Kubrick's movie, this black monolith shows up at a time in history and it changes the consciousness of the beings that are around it. So the, the monolith shows up and then the first murder happened, you know, the, the aboriginals or whatever, he picked up the weapon and he killed the other monkey or whatever, the, the Neanderthals. So this black monolith also shows up on the front website of the Temple of Set, which was Michael Aquino's uh, church of Satan. He created the Temple of Set. And there... Their, one of their logos is this black monolith. So the Temple of Set is also very highly technologically advanced there into, you know, Michael Aquino was the National Security Agency General. So um, this kind of fits in with the idea of the devil and the robotic eye. Did we talk about that before? No, let's okay. please do if you don't mind. Okay, so you know that eye from 2001, How? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. The red glowing eye. Well, you can see this on um, Walt Disney's Meet the Robinsons as the evil hat. And yeah. you can see it in the 
the new droid phone. Um, you can see it in Wally -E as the ship. You know, the Axiom ship is the Jedi. Um, Tim Burton's movie Nine. Uh, it's in a Beyonce video. The Beyonce video is Lady Gaga. She's got um, guys dancing around with this uh, robotic eye as their head. Here it's in Lord of the Rings. Okay, so I kind of take this to mean, you know, the robotic eye of Set. So we talked last time about horse and Set, right? And now that we're past, we're getting past the Aeon of Horus, get, going to the Aeon of Set, this is the new eye that you're going to be seeing instead of the, the eye of Ra or the eye of Horus on everything, you know, the all-seeing eye. A lot right. more of this, um, this red eye of Set is mm -hmm. my uh, theory about what it is. That's so interesting. The rising because sun. You, you go yeah, down the rising the, sun. <sighs> you go Gosh. down to Ground Zero and right across the street from the rubble is, is um, with the Hilton Yes. Hotel, and it's a giant black monolith as well. And they're also yeah. building the first suborbital hotel, which was actually shown in 2001. It was the Hilton Hotel as they were on the lunar base. If you go to the tarot deck, also um, the letter I, I in is the devil tarot, too. So that's where the concept of the evil eye comes from. It was uh, 2010, I guess, the, the continuation of 2001, in which uh, the large group of monoliths came together and actually uh, ignited Saturn, turning it into huh. a second sun. Didn't they try to do that with Jupiter? Maybe it was Jupiter, sorry. Yeah, you're right. Jupiter, not Saturn. Okay. Well, no, they, there was what they called, what some call Project Lucifer, in which they attempted to ignite Jupiter. They crashed a multi-ton nuclear power source from a satellite into Jupiter and most thought it was going to erupt as a second sun. Then there was the string of pearl events, which are very bizarre in their own way. If you watch these, uh, the satellite transmission of these bolides or rocks crashing into Jupiter, they all hit the same spot. Yeah. And it's, it's really a bizarre thing. It's very similar to the 2010 that I was just talking about, about how with the, the monoliths grouping together and all kind of uh, forming within, I guess it was Jupiter, and um, their energy basically sparking the consciousness of that planet, turning it into a second sun, which, of course, uh, thawed their moons and created life there. It was just very interesting when you were talking about the String of Pearls incident. That's what exactly what it reminds me of is the, the movie for 2010 when all the monoliths finally crash into Jupiter and uh, start the sun up. You can't escape the dual sun symbolism or the two sun symbolism, the black sun, uh, or black hole sun is sung, but the the black sun, of course, is the Nazi swastika, and it is part of the ancient beliefs and has been around for quite some time. So the sun behind the sun, the sun of the sun, Jesus, all of these dual sun symbolisms are very intriguing and have led me to believe that there's possibly a binary star, as many believe, as many scientists have have uh, said that there would be a binary star in our system so that we have two suns and one that only comes in and this would cause these uh, cyclical catastrophes mm -hmm. and they have actually even spotted one that is a potential to be our second sun there was a star viewers team out of Spain that announced that G1.9 this uh, star was actually a binary star to our system and was hurtling towards us you know to only increase in speed as it got closer to the Sol or our sun G1.9 actually looks exactly like the Firefox logo. Yep. <laughs> and I don't know, we discussed the whole ah. concept of Fox, and you know, you've got 20th Century Fox, Fox Pictures, FX, uh, Fox Clothing, all of the Foxes that you see around, and of course that equals 666. Right there with your monster drinks and their three Hebrew Vs, which makes 666. Yeah. Then you got to really start to wonder what is going on with this whole puzzle. You see, a lot of times I'm frightened to discuss the, the number of symbols of Satan that I see around us because I'm worried about starting some crazy religious riot. Yeah. <laughs> because if you really it's saw everywhere. what was going on and your, your bitten apples, your pentagrams, your 666s all over, you would be quite terrified <laughs> if you were mm -hmm. really believing Christianity, which. Obviously, they are using this very tool to 
to create their method or they wouldn't put 666s on everything or the members of the skull and bones would not all have names relating to revelations like uh, Magog being George H.W. Bush or Temporary, which was W. I, I absolutely is in uh, Temporary is in Revelations. The, the curious one, of course, was the other skull and bones that ran for president, uh, John Kerry. And his, his skull and bones name seemed to be Long Devil which some believe was an anagram for long-lived, but it, this was one that didn't seem to fit the whole market because they all seem to take on names for revelations. And we see this kind of satanic attack on, on planet Earth. And then 66 being the other one, so when you have FX, that's you know, 66. Uh, w equals 66, or <laughs> VW is 666, and... The 66 is the number of the fallen angels. It's the cleafot in the Kabbalistic practices or the dark side of the tree of life. It's defined as the, the souls of those that have died insane. And even Crowley didn't want to mess with the cleafotic powers. So <laughs> our elite <laughs> encoding these 66s, Lucifer, Satans, and 666s in all, all of that they do. I can show it to you on nearly any major corporate logo or even icon that they use. It all relates back to Loose for Satan and, and 666. So what is the game we're in? Are we at the book of Revelations? Are we actually witnessing the apocalypse? Or are some stage magicians that are practiced sorcerers actually in doing uh, Revelations and the apocalypse on us by using... Uh, symbolic gestures and and magic to purposefully bring about uh, an Armageddon. And then if that is the case, you know, what's the difference, really? Well, that's the funny thing about prophecies is you write something down and there's always going to be someone who will want to fulfill it, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Predictive yeah. programming. Even Jesus uh, said, get me a, an ass so that I will fulfill the prophecy. He had to ride in on a mule. And that's written in the <laughs> Bible that he makes sure that he fulfilled the prophecy. So, you, you know. <laughs> it actually ties into uh, where we were talking about the sun there and now prophecies, the blue star prophecy, the blue second sun or the blue star that um, I believe it's Hopi traditions talk blue of. Star there's, Kachina. Yeah, there's, a, there's quite a few different people who are groups, I guess, that talk about a blue star being the the sign in the sky that will kind of spark us all or make us all realize that we're not alone in this universe. And in, again, 2010, when they ignited the second sun, it was a blue sun. Hmm. Now, curiously, Barack Obama quoted that Hopi prophecy, and the main portion of the quote that he gave was, we are the ones, we are the change we have been waiting for, we are the ones we have been waiting for. So here we have the president who has said he came here from Krypton to save planet Earth, and then he's quoting from Hopi End of the World Prophecies. His name means lightning from heaven, and his catchphrase, yes, we can, means says, thank you, Satan, in reverse. Uh, Unreal. What is going on? A lot of people connected the Norway spiral with the Blue Star Kachina, and I would like people to know that there is such a thing as the new light experiment, which was a giant array of, well, a fan of solar reflectors that was capable of impersonating a sun. And it was basically what you see in GoldenEye in 007. Yeah. This exists. And, and they launched it, and we watched it. And uh, the Russian one, which was the Noyo Sovet, uh, however, my Russian's not so good, but it means new light. Uh, supposedly failed. And we all watched on the news for three days as they attempted to open the array and it wouldn't open. So, the, so they say they let it burn up in the atmosphere. But just recently with the Share International and the arrival of Maitreya, who actually was in uh, Africa with Barack Obama at the same time, and a lot of people think Barack is actually Maitreya, another interesting quirk in this storyline, but Maitreya Man. was supposed to be heralded by a star. And when you see this star that they are showing, you can superimpose the new light uh, fan array right over it and see that it is identical. So now 
There are technologies around us with chemtrails, with HARP, with holograms, the CGI, the, the ability to yeah. recreate reality right before our eyes. Uh, and then these new light experiments that can make a second sun or, you know, fry you like an ant from a magnifying glass. Uh, we can, they can put on such a show that we'll never know whether or not it's God or technology. We're in a, a scary zone where nothing is real. But nothing yet, is real, yes. It sets us free from all of the other bounds that we had, and I think this is something they're underestimating. I think they're underestimating the synchromistic powers and the, the fact that humans are these beautiful beings because as cops are, are always pro the worst of humanity, they actually believe that that is humanity. So when they serve or when they stand above us and say and control us they believe it's their right because well they're there but they see us completely at not as we are and when we do shine i think they're going to be shocked i think so too i think that they're that we're very underestimated and i, I get this all the time well, i'm just one person what can i do it's like oh my gosh you are making a difference right now whether you realize it or not what can't you do can do anything this is the critical ingredient and this is one act of theirs that we should really take note and that is that the only change that's ever going to come is through children if we're not yeah. putting all of our effort into trying to save their minds then we're really wasting our time because the moment you get it to attacking adults and trying to barrage them with your truth or your conspiracy theories you're just beating your head against a brick wall. We are well programmed by this age, and most are not ready to, to break their paradigms. But children are open receptors that believe in the commercials that they see. I always believed mm -hmm. you had to cut Irish Spring to make it work. Uh, <laughs> you know? And so we're programmed and conditioned into these these thought patterns and it's the children that we have to save we can pretty much just let everybody else go hopefully they'll they'll join in with their inner child once they see how wonderful it's going but if we don't get to the children all hope is lost i agree thank you well we have this collection of books called childcraft <laughs> right there you should you should be you, alarms should be going off left and right child yes. crops, you know and <laughs> right there as you start to get into number magic and numerology and and the pentagram it asks you wouldn't you like to be in a secret society have secret past handshakes and and secret knowledge and it gets in and starts defining all of these occult natures of the pentagram and in a book called Mathemagic. Mathemagic, they're like in, you know children encyclopedias. We have a we we gathered some of the more interesting ones, and so when right were these there, published? <laughs> these were published in 1978. Uh, let's just have a look here. Uh, you know, it's just Childcraft Annual, the How and Why Library, put out by World Book or Childcraft International. And I would like to share with you a moment in this book, if I can turn to the right page quick enough. Just from beginning to end, you see sheep and then Egyptian, Babylonian. You see the, the flower of life, the clockwork. Sacred geometry. Sacred geometry, esotericism. Uh, Egyptian concepts of time. So what you see in this whole idea of, of programming this stuff into the children, as I'm reading the Kane Chronicles from Walt Disney and looking at them describing these children having gods put into their bodies that actually burn them out but give them secret powers, uh, then this is the same author that wrote Percy Jackson, that's Disney, also promoting the idea of you being a child of the elite or the gods, and that giving you these special powers. The children are the ones that are being programmed so subtly that the parents just never even see it. But when you see that, well, that these, that uh, the programming going into the scholasticism that's being placed in front of your child, up through college in the Club of Rome, and they promoting concepts like limits to growth getting everyone happy about the love and death of everyone, uh, 
believing this is our only solution, it starts right there and it leads to the end. And it's all within these institutions. Even within like the Harry Potter system, there's a, a huge system of control put down on, on the children, like the Hogwarts students, um, while the adults all play games behind their back and you know, control their future. I mean, how many times did Harry Potter find out that you know, they've been planning this all along for him, you know? Okay. Right. The betrayal is always a classic in the, in the trauma-based story. Got to get them to dislike the adults somehow, right? <laughs> yeah. And just the feeling that you have no support. And that's, that's what they want. The only cure to this trauma-based mind control we're under is security. And so as, if, as you don't provide this for someone in need, then it just carries on and continues. And that's the shaking that I saw at the Rainbow Gathering when they finally felt secure. This is the truth of our situation that we need to feel, we need to make the others around us feel secure, safe, and, mm -hmm. and comfortable. And that's the only way out. People think that this is some sort of analytical problem when it really boils down to just a human love nature uh, problem. Well, okay, uh, so can I share with you from the 1977 Mathemagic Childcraft? It, it says, the magic shape. Do you belong to a club that has a secret password or a secret symbol? Some 2,500 years ago, in ancient Greece, there was a kind of club called the Brotherhood. This <sighs> club was really a school run by the Greek mathematician Pythagoras. All of the young men who went to the school studied mathematics, magic, and religion. They took an oath never to reveal the mathematical secrets they learned. Their penalty for giving away a secret was death. All the members of the Brotherhood wore a symbol that looked like this. It's a pentagram transcribed inside of a pentagon. This shape is called a pentagram, pentagon, which means five angles. And it just goes on to discuss the thing that was secret about this symbol was that nobody else knew how to make it. And it goes on just to promote joining the brotherhood and enjoying your magic spells and it works i think like I, I do a lot of just talking to people who aren't necessarily looking for this information but uh generally once i get through all of the you know secret society stuff with people the first thing that just about everyone asks is well why not just join them exactly yeah i hear that a lot too it's a weird mentality, isn't it? <laughs> it really is. Yeah. It's like, you know, you just finished listening to everything negative that they're doing and you want to go join them? Why? Just to gain their secrets. And that's what it comes down to is secrets um, kind of being glorified to us. Like a lot of people look at that like, you know, as some kind of uh, badge that they could wear or medal. Medal to be won is, is to know a lot of secrets, whereas um, anyone who does have a lot of secrets will be the first to tell you that, you know, it's not a it's not a nice place to be having to keep secrets from people or having to keep secrets from people you love, especially. Look at it this way. We're the first generation that doesn't have to join a secret society to get all the esoteric knowledge. Because yeah. everyone has the little box True. with the word Google, and you can get anything you want nowadays. <laughs> And there's enough, um, you know, defectors and people who've left the orders and written uh, exposés. You can get a book on anything. You don't have to join the Masons to get all the Mason secrets. Even I know the passcodes and the handshakes and, you know, the catechisms and stuff. So maybe back then you might have had to, but now we don't have to. And that's that's one thing I like about Slack Magic is that you can take from any system, but you don't have to adhere to any of them because the, there's something about rituals that. Well, can I just call it robotic, right? It's it yeah. comes from your reptilian brain and is training you to to do the same thing over and over again. Conditioning, any way you look at it, yeah. And there's a side to this as well, which is the uh, the act of performing a ritual, which makes it real to the brain. So all of the pageantry that you'll see within a ritual, all of the effects that you put out there actually will trigger parts of the brain to make it accept that this is a reality and therefore you can actually <laughs> make a difference or you know conform reality to your will as Alistair Crowley would say. The pageantry has another effect that the elite use in that you see the queen running around with all of her minions and all of their fancy fare carrying an orb and a staff and you know if she was just some little old lady sitting in her cottage no one would treat her like a queen 
but you have to have the pageantry just as Hitler did with his his uh, rallies uh, to make the effect on the consciousness to make you feel that they are something special or something elite. Even exactly. Hannah Montana had to put on a blonde wig. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Got to wear the mask. But that's interesting. I mean, as, as a side note or whatever, just thinking about it is um, it's almost like tricking, trying to trick yourself, you know, to to believe. You need to have all this to see, to believe, to. Yeah. And yeah, that's what you kind of got to do to to perform synchronicity. Mm-hmm. Is is leap, you know, the leap of faith, and you make that leap off of your normal reality, and just you 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 panic. I've traveled with a great many people yeah. and taken them out there, and it feels like you're out on an ocean with no port, <laughs> uh, but it's not true, and it's just what your mind creates before it happens, and it's much like the psychedelic experience where John Hopkins University says that the use of psilocybin mushrooms in a controlled environment with the, with the intention of healing, psilocybin mushrooms will give you a life-altering event that has brought 99%, I think even maybe 100% of their uh, test studies out of depression using psychedelics. Well, synchroni- synchromysticism is very much in this same ilk because you have to make this leap of faith and when, if you've ever done a psychedelic, there's that moment of panic when you go, oh, my God, what have I done to myself? And you start to fear what's coming. But then you transition into the actual effect of the psychedelic. And all of a sudden, you're in a wondrous world where everything's just magical. And it's the same with making the leap of faith into synchromysticism. Everyone's afraid to leave their home, their shelter. They don't know what's out there. They don't know what's coming. But... We hope to promote and to show that the the potential is actually out there. And if you limit yourself to your only your known cycle, you're never going to fulfill your own true soul's purpose. Once you open yourself up, actually, you will end up closer to being a millionaire if that's you know your game, and, and than anything else. You have to throw in new experience and just allow it to happen. So. It's it's a beautiful thing, but and it, it can cure depression and and be a psychedelic trip without ever having to take any sort of hallucinogen. We're gonna do it, and they're gonna push us into it. And we can't escape what we came here to experience. So might as well make that massive leap. Use anything you need. The fact that the president might be a clone. That there's a killer comet hurtling towards planet earth that apophis might destroy <laughs> us that a crustal shift could occur a second sun might destroy us there could be nuclear war uh, or some sort of flu pandemic the solar flares might take out everything or and use any of these fear-based events to set yourself free because if any of that be true as all of it's being promoted nice. the invasion of extraterrestrials <laughs> then you're free. You know, quit yeah. your job, save the world, forget it. You don't need their system. It's temporary. It's obvious that it's about to end. So might as well just jump now and enjoy the ride than to be caught off guards or not understand your own true power through synchromysticism. Uh, start the friendship agenda now and not wait for the catastrophe to set you free. Nice perspective. Well, That's guys, a great thing, great way to end it anyways, is to kind of remind people of the power that they have over their own lives instead of giving up that power to everything else around them. Yeah, there's only one way, and that's to love one another. Thank you guys so much for sharing and spreading your wealth. One of the ways to reclaim your power is to, to wake up to these things so that um, you're aware of them, and it, it gives you freedom. Um, some of these things are heavy and hard to hear, but... We can get through anything together, and uh, I, I think that that's really the message that we're all trying to put out there is that let's do it together. Thank you both so much. I look forward to connecting with you again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm glad we're all friends on the friendship agenda. Yeah, absolutely. I look forward to seeing uh, you guys on your bus, and Jamie, eventually you get your book. I'm very anxious to see that. Tell us uh, where we can find you and all that. Uh, well, you can find me hanging out on the Friends of Freeman, friendshipagenda.com. Um, 
I usually friend anyone, everyone, talk to everybody on there. I don't really have any work of my own yet or website or anything like that. So you can just find me on Facebook or on Friends of Freeman. Sweet. And Freeman, you're you're on Freeman.tv? Freeman.tv. Everything Freeman TV is mine. Uh, so I have uh, databases, hundreds of hours, all of this stuff, uh, deep occult researches, hundreds of hours. I hope to keep you busy for years. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, it's I amazing. Do. It's all there at Freeman.tv. All right, kids, go have fun. Have a wonderful evening. I love you, and we'll be in touch. All right, love you guys. Have you guys have a good day or night? I guess it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. We hope that you have enjoyed our most recent broadcast, and we'd like to remind you it is within you to deprogram your mind and liberate yourself from the manipulation that takes place every day through the system of mind control. Knowledge is power and it can help to eliminate fear. We thank you for joining us on this journey to free those minds that are currently being distracted and to empower the spirit of all members of the human family. Together we can remember who we really are and breathe new life into that which they have worked so hard to program, our world. By remembering who we are and our true significance, we can learn to love ourselves and create the harmony we wish to see in the world, free from all fear and control. Love yourself. We love you. Thank you for tuning in and take care of you for us. We're with you. <laughs>